Um, so let's start with one of our oldest known um, zoonoses. Uh, this is called rabies. It was in fact described. Um, so India is uh, one of uh, an Indian sage, uh, Maharishi Shushrut, uh, described it way back, you know, somewhere between 1750 to 500. This is when the Shushruta Samhita was written. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's a very accurate description of it. You can read it here on the screen. But this is one of the first known descriptions, written descriptions of rabies. Now, unfortunately, all of this time later, we still have rabies in our midst. So this very disturbing video that you can see uh, shows you a, a rabid dog uh, that is being quarantined. Now, this is what you expect to see from, from a rabid dog. Very, very aggressive, um, very aggressive and biting and so on. But rabies itself can present in various other ways. So I'll share, share this video with you where, where you see um, a dog sort of walking in a very disoriented manner uh, in the middle of the city. Uh, and unfortunately, this dog is rabid as well. And you can see it's not even avoiding water. It's trying to, in fact, drink water, but it can't because it's, um, because it's, it's, uh, it's, I thought it's paralyzed in some sense. Okay. But rabies does not affect just stray dogs. Um, here is a video of a pet dog brought in a car. This is a Labrador. And you can see that it's got locked jaw. The owner obviously did not vaccinate it in time. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's gotten rabies as well. So rabies can manifest in many different ways. And that's why it makes it such a challenging disease to control. It's very easy to control with vaccination, but it's challenging. And unfortunately, India is a hot spot for rabies. Um, you might not believe it, but India has a, something like 20,000 human rabies cases a year. So rabies is still very much pre present in India. Um, you know, right now we are dealing with the effects of COVID-19. Um, and I think what has been about three and a half thousand deaths or something in that, um, in that, in that range. But here we are, we're talking about 20,000 deaths annually. Uh, in humans. So rabies is still very much a problem. Uh, India represents a third of all cases of ra rabies globally. Um, India, unfortunately, of course, is a hot spot for, for the risk of other emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. And as, uh, as Pranav informed us, it's, you know, uh, most of these, of these diseases are these uh, erids, as they're called, are uh, zoonotic. And, they, and most of them also emerge from wildlife. So as you can see, India and South China are sort of glowing hotspots for the emergence of the risk of these emergence of, of these diseases. Um, now globally over the last 20 odd years, there has been, there's been a consensus building that we can fight uh, these, these diseases or even think of controlling them or mitigating them, their effects using an approach called the One Health Approach. Now, One Health in its, uh, in its very thinking is, is quite simple. Um, if people who work together, um, you know, when it comes to uh, thinking about humans, animals, and as well as environmental health, if you put all of these together and you think about working together in these, in these three spheres, you can then achieve the best health outcomes for all three uh, all three players, that is animals, health, and uh, animals, people, and environmental health. Um, and this one health approach is particularly important for zoonosis because obviously um, zoonosis emerge from animals. So I'll give you an example of one of the projects that we are doing, uh, and this is a rabies surveillance. This is Pune City. We are working with these amazing uh, group of people in Pune, it's, uh, this, this is an organization called Rescue, and they do animal, they run an animal hospital, and they've been working uh, to relieve, uh, to, to help animals in dis distress for quite a long time. So I've been working with them for the past few years, and we've been doing surveillance for rabies uh, in Pune City. So, so the rescue volunteers go out, and if, you know, if they get a call, or if somebody reports on their app that there's an animal in distress, they, they bring it into, into their hospital. And we've then started testing some of these animals for rabies. Okay, uh, this is a large interdisciplinary project. We've got lots of partners. 
uh, it's funded through the India Alliance, uh, uh, DBT Welcome India Alliance program. Um, and so what we do is once we get these dogs inside, we, we test them using these rapid tests and then we save the samples and then we, we bring them to a lab in Bangalore and we, we do confirmatory tests as well. But these rapid tests are really useful uh, for doing field diagnosis. And this is, this is a map of Pune city um, for one year that shows how many infected dogs we found. And each uh, red dog or red dot um, uh, denotes one rabid infected animal. Okay, so I'll just let this uh, animation play out to show you the scale of the problem that we have. Okay, and it's quite frightening as you can see. And this is unprecedented. Nobody has collected this kind of data uh, for rabies in India. So we, we had 318 suspected cases that we tested of which 167, uh, so total 170 cases were positive for rabies. Okay, of which there were even three bovine cases. Thankfully, zero human cases thus far. And that's mainly because Pune uh, is a large city with a good infrastructure, uh, public health infrastructure. People are able to get vaccines easily, post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, and therefore, there are zero human cases uh, from Pune City itself. Okay. Now, you know, trying to understand rabies obviously means you have to understand the ecology of dogs. And this is what we are trying to do now. Um, we are trying to do this in large cities, but we're also trying to do this in rural areas because most rabies cases are reported from rural areas. More than 90% or 5% of human rabies cases come from rural areas. And as we know, um, in rural areas, there's almost no vaccination of dogs. There's very poor pet ownership, responsible pet ownership. Most people have a very laissez-faire attitude about it. Um, but there's also other potential hosts. So we have wildlife, several wildlife species that co-occur with dogs in these areas. So we're going ahead and we've, we're, we're trying to understand the ecology um, of these species as well and really understand the ecology of rabies in, in these multi-host systems. And eventually we'll be able to put together a picture where we'll understand what, um, what, is, the, what is the overlap between these species and um, can we find out how rabies can transmit between, uh, within the dog population, between wild animals and the dogs and then better, better allow us to uh, uh, device strategies for controlling rabies because currently the 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 one method that is used is you know mass vaccination and in a country like India mass vaccination is simply not feasible we need to be able to find better alternatives more targeted ways of doing this kind of control measure only then will we will we be able to achieve the goal of zero rabies by 2030 which is what WHO and the Global Alliance for Rabies Control want to uh, want to achieve. So I'll move on to my move on to the second part of the story. Now um, you can see that there's a high correlation between where there are biodiversity hotspots, where there is high population density, and where there's a risk of emerging infectious diseases. Okay, and that's because there's an intersection of of uh, uh, where as you as you saw from Pranav's talk. You know, where there's more biodiversity also, you know, so for example, you have higher diversity of bats, higher diversity of rodents and other, and, and primates and other host populations, they're also likely to be higher diversity of, of pathogens such as viruses, um, bacteria and so on. And in India, of course, there's, there's a greater uh, interaction between high human densities and the, there's, a, there's a very high human uh, domestic animal wildlife interface. So when people um, access livelihood benefits from forests, they're increasingly exposed to these zoonotic diseases. One example uh, is that of the Kyasunul forest disease. Now this is found in, uh, in southern India along the Western Ghats. Okay. And this is a project that we're doing again with a host of partner institutions. Uh, it's funded through the Global Challenges Research Fund. We have uh, partner institutions in the UK, the Center for Ecolo 
ecology and hydrology, and then a host of Indian institutions, including the government of Karnataka, uh, ICR institutions, ICMR institutions, and of course, like A3 and Institute for Public Health. So this um, uh, excellent team that consists of ecologists, epidemiologists, public health workers, uh, veterinarians, and social scientists is trying to understand um, what is the risk uh, for the emergence of Kyasunur forest disease. Now, as, um, as Pranav was mentioning, Kyasunur forest disease is a flabby virus and it can cause a fairly debilitating hemorrhagic fever uh, to people who get infected by this disease. There are about 500 cases that occur every year with between five to, uh, five to 10 or 30% mortality. The 30% the mortality is a much older figure. Nowadays, it's less than 5% because of better treatment. And the people who are most at risk for this disease um, are tribal groups and resident and migratory farmers, plantation and forest workers. And you know, the, the transmission of this, of this disease is really complex and involves a whole host of different species, including ticks, rodents, primates, and birds. So this is what that transmission cycle looks like. Okay, you can have um, larvae of, the, of these ticks, and these are several species of ticks that we're talking about, which feed on small mammals, monkeys, birds, and they could acquire the, the virus from any of these hosts. And then you have, then these, uh, these larvae uh, metamorphoses or hatch move on to their next stage, which is nymphs. And these nymphs can then attack humans, or they could also attack small mammals and other monkeys and, 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 and birds. And again, uh, some of these may play the role of an amplifying host. Um, and if, um, if really high viral loads occur in these ticks, that's when, and then these, the next stage of these ticks bites a human host or a human, a susceptible human, that's when humans can get uh, get these get this disease and as I said people who work in the forest and uh, who are who are closely interfacing with forest areas are most at risk now livestock or large mammals play another interesting role in this because they are the host for the ticks themselves the adult ticks so they are they're amplifying the population of ticks in the forest itself okay now, some of this work was done, this was pioneering work done in the early, uh, late, done in the late 50s. And this was an excellent example of One Health research with, which brought together epidemiologists, um, public health workers, virologists, tick specialists. So Dr. Raja Gopalan was one of the early pioneers of this. And the institution that was set up, one of the key institutions that was set up to, to understand this risk was the National Institute of Virology. Unfortunately, this, this key One Health research bringing together of, of, um, um, of different disciplines to understand this research, that model was lost. Um, and so now it's taken us another you know, 50 years to bring together this One Health triad again to, uh, to really understand what are the risk factors for emerging forest zoonosis. So we are trying to go back to basics um, and model, uh, model these risks and to build decision support tools. Okay. And understand these complex inter interplay of, uh, of these various factors so we can understand what is, the, uh, was it, what is the hazard and exposure for these diseases. So this is what we have come up with uh, by putting together various factors and land use and land cover change maps. We are able to now predict or create predictive maps of risk for emergence uh, of KFT. This is in a paper that's just recently been published. Um, and using these maps, we're actually able to predict in advance of the risk of emergence and spread. Um, so we need to really scale up this kind of research, um, this kind of One Health research models. And a new uh, initiative that has been um, announced by the government of India, and it is in the works, and I hope that this COVID pandemic really boosts the urgency of this mission, is the National Mission on Biodiversity and Human Well-Being, 
uh, one of the components of this mission is, is the biodiversity and health linkage of which uh, there is a separate subcomponent on One Health and Zoonosis that will aim to operationalize research networks across India. These, you know, we want to really uh, give a boost to these kinds of research networks. And we're hoping that the pilot phase will set up 25 sentinel surveillance sites through a 6 billion rupee fund um, that will really kickstart this kind of research in India. Because as we have seen through COVID-19, uh, you know, the people that are most uh, disadvantaged is not people uh, like us sitting in, in you know, well-to-do in cities, uh, but it's, it's the poorest, most vulnerable people who are the most affected. And we owe it to them as a society to really uh, build up our capacity so that we identify these risks and nip it at the bud. So with that, I will stop my presentation.